Will you please stand as I read our text for this morning? I'll be reading Acts 19, verses 1 through 10. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they, they uh, were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. This is God's word. You may be seated. <clears throat> what we're dealing with this morning um, can easily be uh, spoken of, regarded as a hot topic in, in some circles. And by some circles, I'm primarily speaking of Pentecostal and charismatic circles and denominations, Christian denominations, such as the Assemblies of God, before we get into this, I want to say that they are our brothers. That's not what this is about. But I want to identify the difference in how um, you can approach this text and understand it. According to those who would call themselves charismatics or the Assemblies of God or Pentecostals, what they suggest we are witnessing in this text, because it is a little confusing what's happening here, what they would suggest we are witnessing is what they would refer to as a two-stage conversion, right, or a two-stage salvation. The first stage, they would argue, comes at the point of belief. So you believe, you repent of your sins, you trust in Christ, you become a Christian. That's the first stage. The second stage is marked by a unique outpouring of the Holy Spirit and this unique outpouring, in their opinion, is marked by a unique manifestation of the Spirit, and that is the speaking of in tongues, of other languages. They would see stage one as faith in Christ, and stage two is a little bit of a Holy Spirit booster shot, if you will. Hope that's not too soon. <clears throat> the Assemblies of God, uh, their statement of faith, part seven and eight, um, says this. All believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father, the baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire according to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the normal experience of all the early Christian church. This experience is distinct from and subsequent to the experience of new birth. There is the two stages, okay? This experience is distinct from and subsequent to the experience of the new birth. The baptism of believers in the Holy Spirit is witnessed by the initial physical sign of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them utterance, okay? So this is, in a nutshell, two-stage salvation theology. You repent, you believe, right? You're baptized, and you become a Christian. That's stage one. And then stage two comes with a unique outpouring of the Spirit, which is evidenced by speaking in other, <coughs> excuse me, speaking in other languages, and people who hold to uh, a two-stage salvation uh, theology will often point to a text like this, because what you have is people who are baptized and then baptized and later speaking in tongues, right? That's what's happening here in the text. And so they say this is an example of two-stage conversion. And to that, we want to say, not so fast. There is something going on in this text that we need to pay attention to and we need to understand, and I'm going to argue, that a two-stage salvation theology is not 
uh, the best way to understand this text, right? There is a better way to approach it. So how are we going to work through this? Three things that we're going to consider. The first two are directly connected, and the third one we're tagging on. It's John's baptism, Christian baptism, and speaking boldly, okay? We're going to talk about John's baptism, Christian baptism, and then speaking boldly. So we'll begin by John's baptism. Again in verse 2, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. That's an important comment, by the way. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. So if we are going to understand what's happening here in this, uh, what can't be a confusing text, we have to first ask the question, what in the world is John's baptism? And how is that unique from what they receive or what we will call Christian baptism, okay? So what is unique about John's baptism? We know that John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. Uh, If you remember the Christmas story as recorded in Luke's gospel, uh, Mary was announced that she was going to, uh, uh, she was going to conceive by the Holy Spirit, Jesus, she was a virgin, And she goes then to visit her relative, probably her cousin, whose name is Elizabeth. We know from earlier in Luke that Elizabeth um, was married to Zechariah and she was older and she was barren. She was not able to have a child, though miraculously, Elizabeth finds herself also pregnant. And as Mary goes to visit Elizabeth to share the news that she's going to have the Messiah, Luke records this encounter for us. In chapter 1, verse 41, it says, And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Okay? This is a very interesting interaction. Elizabeth is pregnant. Mary is pregnant with the Messiah. They come together, and the baby in Elizabeth's womb starts to rock out right? It's just like going crazy. And if you are a woman who has carried a child, you know what that is like. All of a sudden, like, ah, kung fu in the womb. And so John is ecstatic when he's getting close to the promised Messiah. We can say that John was a handful in the womb, and he was also a handful outside of the womb. It was John who would call out Herod for his sexual immorality and then would lose his head for it. John was a great man. He was a faithful and bold witness, and he refused to back down. John the Baptist needs to be understood as distinct from the Apostle John. The Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John, First and Second, Third John, and Revelation. John the Baptist is not that John. I know they have the same name. It can be confusing. We're not talking about the same figure. This is Jesus's cousin. And John the Baptist played a very unique role in redemptive history. When Elizabeth uh, gave birth to John, Her and Zechariah went to have him circumcised on the eighth day as it was required in the law. And at that time of circumcision and and, and dedication, his father, Zechariah, spoke and prophesied these words over John the Baptist in verse 76. And you, child, that is John, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways." So we need to understand John is playing a very unique role in redemptive history in part because of his proximity to the birth, the life, the ministry of Christ. John was a prophet who was sent to prepare the people for the Lord. Now, prophets in the Old Testament speak on behalf of God. God will speak to them, and then they will communicate to the people. They predominantly warn of sin and impending judgment and promise a future salvation uh, for a faithful remnant. That's what the prophets do. John is not simply a prophet who speaks but he is a a prophet who was meant to go out before the Lord and to prepare 
the people. In other words, John's job was to announce to the people of God and to prepare them for the fulfillment of all that God had promised uh, to his people Israel through the Old Testament prophets. We get a glimpse of this in John's gospel, chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. John was such a unique, prolific figure that people wanted to know who he was. They couldn't, they couldn't just settle that he was an ordinary guy. And so the question is, who in the world is this dude? John says, so they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John's response. He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So who is John the Baptist? Who was he? Well, he was not Elijah. He was not the prophet. And he most certainly was not the Christ. John describes himself as one who is unworthy to untie the strap of Jesus's sandal. That is the lowest job of a servant. And John says, I'm not even worthy to do that. So John understands who he is and who he is not. He's not the Messiah. Rather, he is one crying in the wilderness, one who is sent to prepare the people for God, but one who was utterly unworthy to Christ. John is proclaiming, make straight the way for the Lord. It's as if John is going about saying this, get ready. Did you wake up? Get ready. You all have been asleep. You all have forgotten who God is. You've forgotten his holiness. You've forgotten the, the sinfulness of your sin. You've forgotten about his promises. You've forgotten his law. He is about to draw near and you better get ready. It's about to happen. We can say that John's baptism was a baptism of preparation. It was a baptism that acknowledged the holiness of God it's a baptism that acknowledged the guilt of sin and a baptism that, that confessed a need for forgiveness. But it was a baptism of preparation. It's about to happen. That is what makes, at least part of what makes, John's baptism distinct from what we might call Christian baptism. And that begs the question, how? is John's baptism different from Christian baptism? So this leads us to the second point, Christian baptism. If John's baptism was a baptism of preparation, then we can say that Christian baptism is a baptism of participation. John's baptism is announcing it's about to happen and Christian baptism announce and announces and declares it has happened. Prepared, participation, it's going to happen. It, in fact, has happened. Furthermore, Christian baptism is utterly unique because it is baptism into something. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Christian baptism is baptism into something. In Matthew 28, verses 19, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When you are baptized, Christian, you are baptized into the holy name of the triune God. You are taking his name. Some of you remember in the law, we are told not to take the name of God. Don't do that in vain. And there's a promise. Anybody who does take that name in vain will not be held guiltless. 
And what we typically think that means is that we're not supposed to speak God's name in a way that robs it of its weightiness. And of course, that is an application of that law. But to take God's name, what does that mean? It's more than speaking. It's to be identified as a family member, to say that his name is my name. I belong in this right now. What happens when a husband and a wife, when a bride and a groom get married, something happens. Well, lots of things happen. We're not talking about all those things. But one thing that happens is that the bride takes the name. The church is the bride of Christ. When we are baptized, we are baptized into the name of God, and now we bear his name as members of his covenant family. To be baptized into the name means to be baptized into his people. If you are baptized, friends, you bear the name of God. You've been baptized into his name. Second, baptism is baptism into the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, this is unique from John's baptism. Christian baptism is baptism into the death and the resurrection of Jesus. In Romans chapter 6, written by the Apostle Paul, this same Paul who is having this conversation with these 12 guys in Acts 19, he says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, the way that Paul speaks of and thinks about baptism is rather different than the, mo- than the way that most modern Christians think about baptism. We think about baptism as something that we are saying publicly. And of course, there is a public witness to baptism. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. There's something even more fundamental about baptism. When you are baptized, you are baptized into the death of Jesus. Now that should make you go, why in the world is that good news? (laughs) Why do I want to be baptized into Jesus's death? Friends, it is good news that you can be baptized into the death of Jesus If you are not baptized into the death of Jesus, you stand before God condemned with a death penalty hanging over your head. Christ came and he suffered and died in our place for our sins. He is our atoning sacrifice. He has paid the penalty and the wages for all of our sin and rebellion. Jesus subjected himself to the righteous wrath of God, all of God's opposition to our sin and rebellion that was all poured out upon Christ our Lord when he was crucified on the cross. And to be baptized into the death of Jesus means Jesus' death is your death. Jesus has paid the penalty that you deserve. He has paid the wages that we deserve. And because we are baptized into his death, because he was condemned and because he suffered, it means you and I will not be condemned and we will not suffer for our sins. If you have not been baptized into the death of Christ, you stand before God, a holy and righteous God. You stand before him condemned. Jesus died for you. To be baptized into his death means you are free from all condemnation because his death, friends, was your death. We are not just baptized into the death of Christ, though. The apostle Paul says that we are also baptized into his resurrection, He says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So we need to be baptized into the death of Christ. We need him to stand before God, to intercede, to interpose, 
to absorb all of the judgment that we deserve. We need to be baptized into his death so that his death is our death, satisfying the law of God and the righteous demands for judgment. But we also need to be baptized into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When I say the resurrection, I do not mean, the Apostle Paul does not mean, none of the authors in the New Testament mean that though Jesus is dead, he's still alive in our hearts. He's still with us in some spiritual sense. That is nonsense. That's not the claim of the Scriptures. When the scriptures, scriptures tell us that he rose, what they mean is that Jesus was crucified, he died, he was placed in a tomb, and on the third day, he literally, physically rose to new life. He was crucified, he died, he was not simply resuscitated. Rather, he went through death and received a glorified body, and now he is immortal. Death has no power over him. He is alive and he is alive today and he is seated on his throne and he is ruling over the nations. Jesus is alive. And when we are baptized, we are baptized into his death and we are baptized into his resurrection. The resurrection is the evidence of Jesus's victory over sin and death. How do you know that Jesus can forgive you of your sins? Because he died and he rose again. How do you know that you can trust him with your life? Because he died and he rose again. How can you trust that Jesus is the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, Emmanuel, God with us, God in flesh? How can you trust that? Because Jesus Christ died and he rose again. His resurrection is the Father's vindication of all that Jesus has claimed and said and he done. His resurrection is the evidence of his victory over sin and death. And in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the new creation is launched and the kingdom of God is inaugurated. Baptism into the resurrection of Jesus means that his victory over sin and death is our victory over sin and death. Do you know that? Because he rose, you too will rise if you have been baptized into his resurrection. His victory over death is our victory over death. Friends, do you know that death will not be the end for you? Death is not a period. It is a comma. You are waiting for what? For resurrection. Because just as he rose, you too will rise with him. One of the very practical, simple applications of that truth is that you, friends, do not need to be afraid. We live in a world that is saturated with fear. Everybody is telling you, you need to be afraid, you need to be afraid, you need to be afraid. I was listening to a buddy of mine preach last week and he was talking about the idolatry of safety. Kids can't play anymore. It's not safe. We can't have playgrounds. It's not safe. You can't have a slide. It's not safe. You can't have a merry It's not safe. You can't do anything. The best thing to do would be to sit in your room and look at your iPad all day and don't talk to anybody. That's very safe. It's also hell, by the way. Don't be captivated by fear, fear of death. You do not need to be afraid of death. If you are in Christ, if you're baptized into his death and baptized into his resurrection, friends, death for you is the doorway to glory. Don't be afraid of it. We don't need to be afraid of anything. So Christian baptism is baptism into the name and the family of God. It is baptism into the death of Christ. It is baptism into the resurrection of Jesus. It's what theologians throughout church history have referred to as the sign and seal of our salvation. It is a sign because in, ba in baptism, salvation is signified. We're seeing something 
If you've ever witnessed baptism, you've, you've probably seen that the people go down into the water and they come up out of the water. You go, what does that mean? Well, there's something being signified in that. We have been united with the death of Christ just as he was laid in the tomb. So we are laid in the waters of baptism. And just as Christ was raised on the third day, so we are raised out of the waters of baptism. In other modes of baptism, you're seeing cleansing and renewal and redemption. There is a sign that is taking place. We are seeing physically something that has taken place spiritually. So in that sense, baptism is a sign, but it's also a seal. It's a seal upon us. It's not unlike a wedding ring, which seals us to our spouse. You enter into relationship with your spouse. There is the taking of a name. There are promises that are made. There's a sign of the unity. You are no longer two flesh. You are one flesh. Your ring is a symbol of that. That ring has no beginning. It has no end. It is one. Husband and wife, you are one flesh. But it's also a seal. You know what this does? You do that? What does it remind you of? You are not your own. You belong to somebody else. Reminds you of the vows that you made. Reminds you of the vows of your spouse. Tells the rest of the world, back off. This thing reminds you of who you are. So too, baptism is a seal. In the Westminster Confession, it says this, baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, not only for the solemn admission of the party baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, of his ingrafting into Christ, of regeneration, of remission of sins, and of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life, which, sacraments, uh, which sacrament is by Christ's own appointment to be continued in his church until the end of the world. I love that. You're going to baptize people, church, till the end of the world. All the nations. So when we consider what the New Testament teaches us about Christian baptism and what it teaches us about John's baptism, it sheds light on what's happening in Acts 19. What we are witnessing here is Paul encounters these guys who have who have not received the Spirit, who have not been baptized into the name of Jesus, but have been baptized with John's baptism, what we are witnessing is not a normative two-stage salvation. Stage one, you believe. Stage two, booster shot. Rather, what we are witnessing here is conversion. This is conversion. These men were not Christians. They are becoming Christians. They had not been baptized into Christ. They said they didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. By the way, that's probably a strong indicator that these are not Jewish brothers because Jewish people knew about the Spirit of God. They hadn't even heard there was a Spirit of God. We can, we can speculate and wonder, John's, John's baptism was a baptism of preparation. It's about to happen. So, did these guys know that it actually had happened? Did they know that what John was pointing to and what his baptism was preparing people for, did they know that those things had actually been fulfilled and completed in Christ and that there was no longer, it was no longer a season for preparing, but it was a season for now participating in what Christ had done? Clearly, they had received some instruction. They knew about John's baptism. This is far removed, by the way, from where John was. So John's ministry was prolific, and word had spread, and he had numerous disciples. But we do know from Acts, and specifically close proximity to Acts 19, we do know that there was confusion about baptism and clarification that needed to take place about baptism. If you were here last week, we talked about Apollos. Remember Apollos? He was a fervent speaker, a passionate instructor, and remember Priscilla and Aquila, like, ah, we got to pull you aside and talk to you about a couple things, right? Do you remember what the issue was? 
Acts 18, verse 25. He, that is Apollos, had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only what? The baptism of John. Had these guys learned about John's baptism through Apollos? We don't know, but we do know there's some confusion. In this unique time of redemptive history, as the Jewish age and the Christian age are overlapping, there is this moment where John said it's going to come, and now Christian baptism is proclaiming it has happened. There's this moment of that transition where there is, a communi- there is confusion So I think that what we are seeing here is not a one-stage salvation followed by a second stage of salvation, but we are getting a front row seat to a conversion of a group of men. They had received John's baptism of preparation, but they had not received Christian baptism. Upon belief, it is clear like all Christians, that they had received the Spirit. But unlike all Christians, it also is clear that the Spirit had manifested itself uh, in in a unique way through these men speaking in different languages. But what we are seeing is not two stages of salvation. We are seeing salvation. Now, now you're all equipped to go argue against two-stage salvation, right? And baptism and all that stuff. What does this have to do with you? Does it have anything to do with you? I think this presents us with the most important, the weightiest, most consequential question that you will ever have to wrestle with and deal with in your entire life. And that is this. Are you a Christian? Like, are you actually a Christian? Or are you like the guys in this story? They, they have this knowledge. They have this preparation. They have this religious commitment and interest. But it's not uniquely Christian. They're becoming Christians but they're not previous to this. There's, there's a lot of people who are like that. People who are around Christians. People who would call themselves religious or open. People who have information, who could answer questions about theology in the Bible but that's not the same as being a Christian. The question before us this morning, the question before you is, are you a Christian? Or are you playing games? Are you trying to deceive God? Do you think you will trick him? Are you taking this stuff seriously? This is the most important matter in all of your life. Your relationship to God, your salvation in Christ, your eternity, that is the most important issue before you. And it is so important that you are clear about this. If you are not baptized into the death of Christ, friends, you stand before God this morning condemned. You are in danger. You cannot save yourself. You cannot work yourself out of the situation. You cannot will yourself out of it. You cannot tip the scales in your favor through devotion or anything. Only Christ can save you. There is salvation in no other name. It's in Christ alone. Have you come to terms with Jesus? Don't play games. He came, he suffered, he died, and he rose for you. Friends, he will save you. He is able to save to the uttermost, but you must repent. You must come to him in faith and repentance, and he will cleanse you, and he will give you his name, and he will make you new, and he will make you a a member of his family. 
It's amazing when you talk to people, you hear a similar story. I thought I was a Christian for years and years and years, and then I realized I wasn't. Friends, don't, don't be fooled. Don't play games with this. This is about eternity. This is about the glory of God. This is about your soul. Come to Christ. He is a faithful Savior. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will save you. If you are not a Christian, friends, today is the day. Today is the day for you to come to Christ. Don't put it off till tomorrow. How do you know what tomorrow holds? There is no promise that you or I will even wake up tomorrow. Right now, grace and salvation and redemption is staring you in the face, saying, come. Are you tired? Are you guilty? Are you burdened? Come. And he will set you free. The second question we have to ask is, have you been baptized? If you are a Christian, there is no reason for you not to be baptized. Many of us separate faith and baptism. We think that we come to Christ in faith and someday later when we're, when we're more committed or whatever, someday later, then we will be baptized. You will not find that anywhere in the book of Acts. If you are a Christian, don't separate faith and baptism. Be baptized. Don't cohabitate with the church. Enter into formally the waters. Receive the sign and the seal. You say, okay, I'm convinced. When can we do that? I'm glad you asked. In May, we're having a baptism party in the parking lot. Food, baptism, celebration. Woo! Sign up. Sign up. If you haven't been baptized, sign up. Lastly, bold witness. In verse 8, it says, He entered the synagogue, and for three months, he spoke boldly. Luke in nearly every description of the preaching and teaching ministry of the apostles, whether it's John, it's Peter, it's Stephen, who was a deacon, or it is Paul, he says they spoke and proclaimed the truth of God boldly. Boldly. This is why there is so much conflict throughout the book of Acts. Consider what would happen in this interaction if Paul just kept his beliefs to himself? What if he did not say, have you received the Spirit? Are you even a Christian? What if he doesn't say that? What happens with these men? We don't know. We don't know because Paul did speak boldly. It's why in this text he got kicked out of the synagogue. Here's the irony Paul entered the teaching place for God's people and taught the scriptures boldly, and they said, no, thank you. So what does he do? He just changes the location. Well, we got a hall down the street. We'll go there. And he continued to speak boldly. I want to encourage all of you in this to speak boldly. Friends, many people are going to tell you that you need to be quiet. The world is going to tell you that speaking the truth is insensitive, it is arrogant, it is prideful. The world is going to tell you that nobody can really know the truth, so you should stop acting as if you somehow know the truth. To which we should say, how do you know that truth? The world is going to tell you that you need to be accepting of everyone's own personal truth. You're going to be told it's not the content of what you say that matters. 
It's the way that you are perceived by others that matters. The world is going to tell you that talking about things like sin and death and hell and judgment and the cross, those things are not very winsome. They will tell you that the Bible is outdated. If you want to see people come to Jesus, you want to see people come to church, you're going to have to modernize that old book, which is code for abandon the righteous standards of God. Friends, the world is going to tell you a million different lies, and you need to remember this. Proverbs says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There are a lot of people who are pursuing a way that seems right to them, but its end is the way to death. There are many people who have bought into our enemy's lie. They are running hard after pleasure and fulfillment and identity and freedom, and they are betting their lives and their eternity on a lie, and they are going to be devastated when they find out that way and that lie does not work. Do you know what they need? They need someone to speak boldly. They need someone to speak to them like Paul spoke to them. Talking about weighty, sometimes uncomfortable, difficult things. Church, it's not a time to be quiet. It is a time to speak boldly. And so I want to encourage you to not be afraid because Jesus is with us and Jesus is for us. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, what a blessing and privilege it is to participate in your death and your resurrection, to be united with you in death, that we might be united with you in life. Lord, what grace and mercy we have been given to bear the triune name of God. Lord, help us to understand the great privilege of our baptism and our union with you. Lord, by your spirit, help us to walk in newness of life, turning away from sin, walking in obedience, and speaking fearlessly and boldly for you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.